Okay, well, I'm Chris Crutcher. Um, very happy to be uh, part of this part of this uh, this afternoon coffee get together. It's a little earlier in the afternoon for me than it is for you because I'm on the West Coast. Um, for those of you who don't know my my work, I've I've written a number of books. Um, young adult. Most of the books that I've written are young adult books. Uh, I have supposedly a pretty pretty good following of boy readers and and I get a lot of feedback back from or feedback from kids who have never read a book before who which makes me feel really good because I was one of those kids I I, I didn't read I in my early high school years I found all my brother's old homework and I became um, what I could what I consider to be the first academic ecologist because I uh, I recycled all my brother's homework instead of doing the reading I was supposed to do. So I was way behind. As as a writer, I was way behind. You you can't you can't write if you don't read. And my my the reading that should have taken place when I was in high school and college probably took place in my twenties. So I was thirty five before I ever had the nerve to sit down and start writing stories. And I'd had a, a history, at the, t at the time I'd had a 10 year history working in alternative education down in Oakland, California, mostly with kids who had been thrown out of the Oakland public schools. And I had a real, um, I hadn't written anything yet, but I wanted to. And all, I realized that I was, I, I was in writer's heaven because I had characters, I mean every kid in that school had a story and it was K through 12. So kindergarten kids through 19-year-olds. And I, was, I started kind of gathering information, gathering characters, looking for stories. Then I started working up in, uh, I came back up to the Northwest, where uh, not too far from where I grew up, about 400 miles from where I grew up in Idaho. I came back up to Spokane, and I had been a psychology major and sociology major in, in college, and I, I started working with um, child abuse families. And boy, there you know stories all over the place there, and you can't take those stories and put them into books without a, a really good lawyer and no ethics. But one of the things that I recognized was that I'd hear these stories, and I'd hear another story, and then 50 stories, and 100 stories, and the similarities in those stories and the similarities in people's responses kind of started floating. The truth started to float. And I would kind of scoop the truth off and put that into my imaginary characters and all of a sudden I had all kinds of stories to write. What I didn't recognize, and I, I, I was lucky enough to have a friend who was a writer, so I had an in into the business. I had an agent that I could send things to. Um, she had, she had uh, editors that she you know, knew to go with, with young adult material and was particularly with stuff that had a sports backdrop to it. And in a very short period of time from the time I sent my first book in, I was actually published, which is, I, I thought my parents were going were gonna to kill themselves just so they could roll over in their graves when they found out that I was, uh, that I was writing, I was writing the very thing that I would never read. And um, the other thing that I started to notice was, fa fairly quickly, was that I started getting a lot of, a lot of uh, challenges. I started getting a lot of censorship uh, challenges, book bannings, different places in the country. Partly because I tended to use the language for my characters that I heard the stories in and the realistic language that kids who grow up in hard times have. And um, the situations were unusual and they were pretty disturbing sometimes. Uh, you know, you can't, you can't you can't live in that world. You can't live in a teenage world without talking about sex. I mean, if you do, you're not being realistic. And I was working with people who had been sexually abused, and I had I was working with families that were doing the abuse, and I had this, from a writer's point of view, a wonderful uh, kind of standpoint place to watch, to watch people try to put their lives together. Got to see a lot of failure. Got to see quite a bit of. Uh, what became what started to become heroism for my characters. I mean, people who were standing up under situations that I could never have stood up under. And I realized that that was a place to start telling stories. One of the other things that I realized was that I was listening to stories that happened way more often than we were willing to talk about as a culture. And I started looking at the statistics of 
you know, the kids that I was working with and the parents that I was working with. And there was a lot more child abuse and there was a lot more sexual uh, misconduct and there were a lot more horrible abuse or ho horrible abuse and neglect situations. And those, I, I thought, man, you know, I've been living for a long time. I grew up in a town where there was probably a lot of this going on, but you just didn't pay attention to it. And family secrets were family secrets. And then I started to recognize, and some of that was be because of, of the letters that I would get back, was that putting those family secrets into stories allowed kids to talk about them more and allowed parents to talk about them more because they didn't really have to talk about their own lives. They could talk about the characters in the story. And it provided, I noticed, kind of an insulation. You would start to feel this, this sense that uh, I won't tell you about myself, but I will talk about this story and I will judge whether or not I like you by if you like the same characters I like and if you respond to the story in some of the same way that I respond to the story and that if you're astonished when I'm astonished if you're a teacher or a librarian or things like that and there were some connections being made and I thought wow you know this is what literature is supposed to be about and of course I couldn't keep up I couldn't write fast enough to, 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 to keep some of the stories going that um, that I had to tell. I mean, I'm still many, many stories behind. So that's that's kind of how I got into it. The second piece for for me, and I think the thing that that brings in a lot of guy readers that don't ne that don't necessarily you know don't consider themselves readers, is that I grew up in a really small town. We had fewer than a thousand people in my in my hometown. My high school, uh, four years of high school was like under a hundred kids. My, my high school graduating class was 15. We had five boys and 10, or five girls and 10 boys, which left, at us, left, left us at a, a horrible disadvantage. But everybody played sports. So I got to play sports that I had no business. I, I didn't have the talent to be playing had I been in a, you know, in a, in a regular sized high school. But that you know the knowledge of those sports and the and the you know my my connection to coaches and the the high school uh, you know the the whole high school uh, the, the sports milieu if you will um, works its way into my stories. I don't consider them sports stories, but th there's always a sports backdrop, and that has that has a a certain uh, draw to kids that don't necessarily read well that they read they read sports illustrated and they read mechanics books and they read cereal boxes and things like that but they tend not to read books so that's kind of that's kind of my history I've been writing since um, I think my first book was published in 83 I started writing in 82 um, so I've got about a 30 year history and um, have never been asked a question I wasn't willing to answer so I'm more than willing to have some you throw some questions at me here It says you will, there we go. <laughs> oh, my experiences with rejection. You know, in terms of having stories rejected, I've had almost none. I sent my first book in. Um, I Really early on, I sent some short stuff into magazines and things like that, and and those were roundly rejected, but and they really should have been because they weren't very good. Once I actually sat down and got this story together, um, running loose, uh, it got published. I, I I had a friend who was a who was a writer, and I sent him their manuscript, and he read it and thought it was good, and he said, I'm, I'm going to call my agent. You send it in, and within the week, she decided that she would represent it, and she knew right where to go because number one, his his stories had been about his, his, his first book was about a, a high school athlete and it had some similarities to mine so she knew right the places to go I think she got one rejection and she didn't even send it to me until until she had published the book and then um, after that everything I've written has been has been published I had a I had a couple of false starts where my agent said excuse me but this isn't any good and I went back and, and I, I went back and uh, redid it but after that I was in pretty good shape um, 
Oh, the current. What should be done with the current state of education? Boy, that is such a question. You know, I, I, I think we took a real, real, real bad left turn when we, when we, when we bought into No Child Left Behind. I think, I think it was, I think the ideas behind it, the thought behind it was, was, was good, but it just went the wrong direction. All of a sudden, all we were doing was testing what people could memorize. It took all the fun out of it. It took all the creativity out of it. It almost destroyed teachers' lives. I mean, it, it took away from it took away from that uh, it took away from that sense of uh, being there to do what you know that that fun thing you wanted to do by being a teacher, by going back and learning, by you know getting into people's creativity, getting into people's imaginations, and. You know, I think it. I think it. I think there's some there's some rocky things on both sides. I think we keep. We I think we have teachers in schools that shouldn't be in schools. Like we have we have teachers in schools that, you know. You know, I I mean I go to schools where there are teachers who don't like kids, and that's just that's that's inexcusable. But I you know the other side of that is there are teachers who would do anything to help kids, and I, I think we need to pay attention to that. I think we have to have accountability, but it can't just be memory level level stuff. And um, I think we have to say that we need to have a war on a war on illiteracy. Just like I mean, if we spent if we spent one year's one year war in Afghanistan or war in Iraq on our education, a, a whole bunch of really good things would happen. I think if we had the right people guiding them. Um, how does it feel to be an author whose books are banned and made less available to their target audience? Um, you know, I write young adult literature because I have kind of a young adult attitude. I've got, I, I never quite grew out of adolescence and I'm a little bit combative. And when I see those books being banned, one of the things that I recognize is that they're being banned by people who have exactly an opposite worldview of mine. And um, what makes me sad is that there are a lot of uh, administrators, m way more than teachers, a lot of administrators around the country who are more worried about listening to a small group of very loud people, and that's usually the Christian right, than they are to serving the people who are their clients, who are the students. And um, so they're less available in one sense, but this is the United States of America. You can't ban a book. You can only keep it out of a school. And I try to be loud, and I, I'm loud when, when my books get banned, and it isn't because I think my books are better than any other books that get banned or any books that don't. It's because I know my books, and when they get banned, it isn't about, it isn't about my books. It's about the banners. It's about the people who want the books censored. It's about control issues. It's about thinking that if we can keep kids ignorant, we can keep them safe, and I think that's foolish. And so... The, one of the other things that I know is that when I get, when I can make that public conversation happen, the people who are going to change this are the kids. They'll go get the books. And I'll tell you what, when you get a bunch of kids at a school board meeting, it's a lot harder to argue with them than it is to, you know, to have this philosophical adult argument that we tend to have about the First Amendment. Uh, who has a bigger voice, the censors or the teachers and the students who love and are engaged by the writing? In the beginning, the censors have a bigger voice. They are, they, they are all over the internet. They are all over the internet. I will get, I will get a complaint. I will get a, 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 a you know, the, the charges against my stories, and it'll come from Arkansas or Alabama, and then I'll see it, you know, with the exact same wording from Idaho or from Wyoming or from South Dakota. And one of the things that I realized is these guys are smart. They use the internet. They do, they do the same thing we do. Well, I use the internet too. Boy, I get, I mean, I go out there and when I, when my, if you ban one of my books in one of your schools, five of my books go to your nearest public library and I write the newspaper and tell them about it. Because I want kids to know and I want teachers to know that you can't ban a book. And when the teachers fight back and when they have backing by administrators, when administrators step up and say, wait a minute, the real experts in education here are the teachers. They went to college to do this. They've read a lot of books. They've been in front of a bunch of kids. They know which books to put in the hands of which kids for what purpose. And I'm going to listen to those guys a long time before I listen to people who want to get their, who want to get their information from some conservative group of people 
who once again think we want to we want to control what goes on in our children's minds because you can't do that it's foolish I mean the fastest way in the, if my parents had wanted to get me reading they just would have had to t tell me I couldn't read it I mean I was an adolescent for crying out loud that's developmental I'll jump on that in a minute um, embarrassing or amusing anecdotes that didn't make it into King of the Mile Frontier man I told most of them but really interesting I three days ago I got a uh, I got an email from this guy. He's about four years older than I am, or five. His name is Mel Karras, and he lives in Cascade, Idaho. Or well, he lives in Baker, Oregon now. But he grew up in Cascade, Idaho. His mother and my mother were really good friends when they were kids. And Mel was a renegade, and he he, he, was, he was in trouble all the time in school. And I knew about it because I would see him. We, our school was so small that the elementary school and the junior high and the high school were all in the same building. <laughs> and you could see Mel leaving school in the middle of the day because the principal had sent him home. But he worked in my dad's service station. My dad hired him. And he was a great worker. He was a wonderful guy. He knew everything there was to know about a car. And Mel would tell me these jokes. I mean, really raunchy jokes down at the service station. And I didn't understand the jokes. But I knew they were really funny because all the other high school kids would laugh. And I was in like the fourth grade. So I would go back to school and I would tell those jokes to my fourth grade buddies. Now, all we knew was that they, that they must have had something to do with sex and that they, we weren't, weren't supposed to be telling them. And I would always go back by the coats. We'd, we'd stand back where the coats were hung up. And the teacher would look up and she would see me back there with a bunch of kids by the coat rack and she didn't even come she didn't even ask me what we were talking about she just sent me to the office because she knew that I was telling Mel Cross's jokes and there are in 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 King of the Mild Frontier the sequel um, I will have to include some of those jokes because they were just I mean they were embarrassing I remember coming home from the service station one time and my mother was having bridge club and um, Mel had just told me one of his great jokes, and I, it was so far out that I didn't get it, but I knew it was really funny, and my mother brought me, I came into the house, and my mom, uh, you know, she always wanted to show me off a little bit, so there were like four card tables around the living room, and all these nice older women playing bridge, and they all thought I was really cute. And one of them was kind of rubbing me on the head, and I said, you want to hear a joke? And she did, and so I told it. And, man, the room went quiet. The room went silent, and then all of a sudden I was escorted out of the room. So I was a goner. Uh, my next or current writing project. Um, you will see it on the shelves in nine months, I think. It's a book called... Um, I'm, I'm just doing the finishing up of it. In fact, just before I came on, my last, my last thing that I do before, before the book is in its final stages with the publisher, and, and I've already I've, I've worked a lot out, out of this with my editor, um, I read the whole thing out loud, like beginning to finish. And I'm in that process right now. It's a book called Period 8. Uh, it's a story about a... a the, prota the protagonist. The protagonist is a senior in high school. His name is his name is Paul Baum, B A U B A U M. But they call him Polly Baum, B O M B. And um, he has a great relationship with this teacher who's about to who's about to retire. And the teacher's my age. He's well, I'm 65, and the teacher's 64. But I started writing this book about a year ago, and he's coming into the la the end of it, and. For 30 years, his, his class has been opened at noontime to come in, for kids to come in and talk about real stuff. And they call it period eight because there are seven periods in the day. And in that group is a full-blown psychopath. He's the, he's the student body president. And he's into some seriously sinister stuff. And you don't see him coming. Uh, you don't see how sinister it is until he, he basically... Uh, gets two or three of the girls in school really compromised with older, older men in the community. And he's, I mean, he's basically working as a, as a kind of a psych, psychopathic pimp. And um, so in, in some senses, it's a, it's a mystery and it's a thriller as the main character running it through the teacher starts to understand what's happening to these, to these girls. And it's called Period 8, and I think it comes out, it should come out right after 
uh, right after Christmas of next year. Um, I, how many comic books did I read? Did I read as a teen? I, I read comic books all the time as a teen. I, I uh, my dad was a little bit of a freak. One of the very, very cool things. I, my, my, my little kid life was like the fifties, and one of the very, very cool, fun things we all did was um, we uh, we traded comic books. You get together one day a week. And everybody would bring these boxes of comic books, and we'd trade. And you'd spend all afternoon trading, you know, Superman, Spider-Man, Veronica, and, and Betty, Archie comic books, uh, Richie Rich, you know, the funny stuff, the superheroes, a few classics. I wasn't real big on the classics, but my dad hated mess. He hated mess. And he wouldn't let us accumulate comic books. It made me crazy. And what he would do was he would he would let us have new comic books, but to get a new comic book, you had to dump an old comic book. So I would have to hide my comic books so that he couldn't find them any place and go off and do the trade and save a couple back to give to him so I could get new comic books. So I was the I was the uh, I was the guy on in the comic book trade who had all the new stuff to, to trade, and then I'd have to have to sneak around. I was I was a I was a pretty devious little dude, and a lot of it had to do with comic books. I don't read them anymore. I I mostly is it's just it's just time. I look at all these great uh, um, graphic novels, and I'd I'd like to get back into reading some of those because some great stories I think are coming out from those. But I, I really haven't had time to get um, to get doing it. Do I see? Do I foresee censors targeting period eight? I sure do. They're going to get all over this book. Um, for one thing, um, although I have some really, really cool Christians in there, they, I do. I've got. I mean, I've, I've, I've hammered. I've hammered. Uh, uh, I haven't hammered Christianity, but I've hammered uh, far right wing, no, you know, no mistake Christianity pretty hard. And they're a group. Of, they're a group of. Uh, um, Characters in here that are part of a you know part of a of a, a young a young young Christian movement a young Christian group in that are that are uh, they're all good guys and uh, I won't get hit too hard for that but this has got some pretty rough stuff in it it's got some pretty ugly issues that it attacks and uh, so I'll get I'll get shot down with that. Do I read much fiction becoming? I read a lot of fiction becoming a writer. Um, I have to. I mean, you know, if I want to go to, if I want to get good at this, I have to read the masters. Um, I love uh, the color purple. I read it over and over. I love anything cut by Kurt Vonnegut. Uh, I think Tim O'Brien's The Things They Carried. I don't. I don't think a better book was written in the century. Um, Sherman Alexi. I've read all of Sherman stuff. I know Sherman. Um, I've always thought he was just a just a stunning, stunning uh, um, talent. I read Stephen King at his best. I think there that you'll never find a better plotter than Stephen King. Boy, that guy knows how he can tell you a story with you know, it you know, seven characters, six or seven characters as kids, same six or seven characters as adults. Everybody gets stage time. All comes together. That ain't easy. And if you watch him, his newest book is a, a guy who goes back. There's a book about a guy who goes back to uh, uh, kill Lee Harvey Oswald before he does the dirty deed, and uh, the plotting on it is just—it's just masterful. John Irving is another one. I mean, you got to if you, you Irving will teach you how to write as you're reading his story. So I'm I'm a I'm a huge fan of of those guys. Christopher Paul Curtis, if you want to you know get back uh, Walter Dean Meyer, my goodness, you know those guys are. Those guys are telling just stunning stories. The story I'm proudest of so far, um, the, the thing that gives me pride in stories usually is feedback. I mean, I, I, I'll write a story and I'll think it's good. I know what I meant, but how it lands probably, probably gives me the most pride. So in that regard, it's probably got to be whale talk. St staying fat for Sarah Burns in Deadline, those three 
give me back the kind of response that I really want as, as a writer. I don't think I have anything to teach anybody. But what I do think is I have uh, a way to get a way to get um, dialogue going, a way to get a way to get issues talked about that people are afraid to talk about. And those stories cover sexual issues, they cover racial issues, they cover all kinds of bigotry stuff, all kinds of things about you know the the, the stuff people are talking about about the gay community and. And you know whether gays should serve in the military and whether they we should treat them with decency. Give me a break, right? In terms of marriage and those kinds of things, um, those books all covered, you know, those areas. And I think I felt unflinching when I wrote them. And I hear that word back all the time. And when I hear that word back, that makes me proud. That makes me proud. Any more questions? Ha ha. What, you know, the really good question. Um, the advice that I have for authors having trouble writing fiction. Um, step away a little bit. Most, most writers, when they start writing fiction, they'll look at something in the real world and they'll, they'll, they'll want to tell a story about it. And the big mistake, and I made it a bunch of times, getting traction when I wrote Running Loose, I, I, I got too married to wanting to tell the story kind of as it happened in real life and only just change the, you know, change the names, and thinking that somehow everything that happened and my responses to it were the most important things in the world. And they're not. What's important is to, you get that thing that you want to tell a story about, and then you get to use your imagination. Your imagination is the place that fiction ferments. It's the place that fiction bubbles. I mean, it's, that's where it all happens. And what you want to say to yourself is, I want to, I want to, um, I want to step back and let the character tell the story. In the in the beginning, when I first started writing stories, it was Chris Crutcher named somebody else, and. An editor will know in, in the first page, the editor can see you working. The editor can read self consciousness. And when I finally got traction with Running Loose, one of the things that I realized was it isn't Chris Crutcher telling the story, it's Louis Banks telling the story. He's telling the story to Chris Crutcher, and Chris Crutcher's getting it down for it. But it's a different guy. He knows what I know, or he knows what I knew then. But he's going to be more heroic, probably, than I am. He's going to be more damaged than I, than I was. But I'm going, to be able to give, I'm going to be able to step away from it. And then I'm going to say, don't start sitting around worrying about your audience. Don't decide what people are going to, how people are going to respond to your story. Write it. And write it in its rawest form. Get it out there in front of you. You can edit it. Editing is where it all happens anyway. Rewriting is, is the real creativity. It's not the writing. Get it all down there. Joseph Heller used to say, morning is throw up time, afternoon is clean up time. Get it down in front of me so I know what to I know how to get it out of there. And then and then tell your story. Um yeah, I can't tell you too much about comic books now, but um my comic books as a teen were superheroes. I love Superman, I love Captain Marvel, I loved all the cowboys, I loved uh Heroes, I liked heroes. Rocky Lane, Lash LaRue, uh, you know, all these cowboys that could do. I mean, I wanted to be a cowboy when I grew up. There was there were no cowboys left, but I wanted to be one. You know, Roy Rogers was there, but the old, uh, um, there were those guys there. And anything that could fly, or Aquaman, you know, any if you could get around different than I had to get around, if you had some superpower that would let you do that, Man, I was with you all the way, and I just, I mean, I love the idea of being able to just conquer all. Um, I love the, the Archie comic books, and, you know, particularly the Veronica and Betty. The old thing is, you know, if you could have a girlfriend, would it be Veronica or Betty? It was Veronica. Uh, I mean, they, they got my early fantasies going before I even, you know, snuck around and found my dad's Playboy magazines. Um, and I loved... I, I loved humor. I loved uh, 
snappy comebacks. Little Lulu had some great stuff in it. Later on, what and actually they came out as cartoons, but you got them later also as comic books, uh, Bullwinkle and, you know, th those comic books. And the simplicity of those things, the little setup, they just walk you right through it. And um, I'm not visual enough. I'm not as good, I'm not as good as, uh, you know, I'd love to, I would have loved to have been able to uh, visualize stories the way the comic book writers did. But those comic books got me, you know, they made me think, they, made, they, they, they really did, they made, me, they made me think about characters, they made me create characters. And uh, I, wanted to get the, I wanted to get that funny response. If I could make somebody laugh, I'm, I'm all over the place. The funny papers. Uh, God, I read, I read the funnies, Pogo, when I got a little bit older and understood a little bit about political humor. Uh, but, you know, the, the Dennis the Menace, God, I love Dennis the Menace. You know, those, I mean, he had comic books and he had, I love Peanuts. Um, you know, those things were all over the place. So they, they had a real, they, had a, they, they get into you. The good thing about comics is they get into you in your formative, they get into your hard wiring. You know, I can go back and I see those things now and they make me laugh. So, yeah, that's, that's good stuff. Um, you know, I used to, do I have any tools or methods for keeping keeping ideas. I used to have, like my mind w did that for me. Uh, and in my, in my, uh, and this goes to writing process too. I've always been kind of ADD. I think I was, I think I, had they had that designation, I probably would have been diagnosed. I had a real, real bouncy mind. And I mean, I'd walk into, I didn't think I was very smart. I would go walk into a classroom and if you didn't get my attention in the first 15, uh, in the first five minutes, I was gone. I mean, I was out the window. And I could make it look like I was listening, but I was nowhere around to be found. Well, when I started writing, I found myself, I found myself in that same place. I'd start off with an idea and then, you know, my bing, 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 and off I go. But I started, I started, um, I started to recognize, and you see a lot, this happens in a lot of characters that I create. I started to recognize that if I got my heart running, if I got my heart beating fast, my mind slowed down. And I was a swimmer, and I was actually, that was the one sport that I actually had some talent. But it, it turned into running. And I would go out every time I'd get an idea. Get out on a run, come back from the run, type out. I mean, I'm sweating all over the keyboard. Type out the ideas that I got when I was running, and they would, all, they would fall into place, and they would be sequential. My mind, my mind worked so much better when I was moving. And that's been proven out by the brain scientists. I mean, they're talking about now that you should be putting treadmills instead of desks for some kids in rooms, because if they can move, they can concentrate. I can't always get back in from my writing or from my running now and still remember this great idea that I had 15 minutes ago. So now I uh, now I run with a uh, one of those. Uh, well, my iPhone has one. It has a little recorder on it, and so I'll be running along and I have an idea and I pop the recorder and I just say three or four words that give me the idea into the recorder, and then when I come back and I'm playing it. I mean, you can, I can hear my feet hitting the ground, for one thing, and I can hear myself going, <sighs> and then I'll spit out whatever the idea, idea was. So I get back, run it back, you know, run my little recorder, excuse me, run my little recorder back, type in the ideas, and then I go back, and I get my chronology that way. I get the, I get, I get the story. And then, I, you know, the deal is go out, move around, get the idea, come down, sit down. And I can do it walking. I mean, I can go out and I can walk around the kitchen if I need to. But um, I get I, more, <laughs> the harder I run, the better the ideas are. Music. Oh, man, oh, man. Music really influenced me. Um, any theme, I mean, Bob Dylan, right? Any half the stuff Bob Dylan wrote, I didn't understand. But the half that I did understand gave me theme, gave me, oh man, why don't you write a story about that? I mean, you know, I mean, I grew up, my high school and college is the 60s. So all of this, all of this uh, challenge authority, stand up against the man, up, up against the machine was everywhere. So Beatles come in when I'm in high school. Um, Elvis Presley, I mean, Elvis Presley was on the Ed Sullivan show and they wouldn't let the camera go below his waist because he was obscene. You know, Elvis is, Elvis is doing the, the hip swivel. 
And I mean, that 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 stuff was great for me. And then the Beatles move into their, you know, at first the Beatles were just pop guys, and they were they had I want to hold your hand, I want to hold your hand, and pretty soon they're right in the middle of of you know the Vietnam War and the you know all the all of the protesting and the uh, themes that came out of that. Later you move on into I mean Pink Floyd and you know a lot of the kids that I worked with as a as a um, um, as a teacher, when I was working in the alternative schools, you know, Pink Floyd was their suicide, you know, they got their, all that stuff going. And um, so I'd be, I'd be, I'd be, uh, you know, picking up themes from that. And I listen to music now, I'll go into the alternative rock or I'll, you know, good relationship stuff. Uh, half the time I don't even know who I'm listening to, but I get on iTunes and I'll find a, I'll find a, a uh, a musician and then just you know you can go and listen to half of you know all their stuff I was a great lover of folk music um, and so I you know the themes that come through that f family stuff uh, Harry Chapin you know telling his telling his musical stories boy that stuff just gets you going I, I mean I music and I listen to it all the time now and you know I've got my fancy little Bose earphones and so I'll listen to songs and then and then and then, and you know, a lot of old, a lot of old, I mean, I was, I grew up in the Christian church. I got a lot of great old Battle Hymn of the Republic. There's about 50 different, 50 different renditions of that that just give me goosebumps. So any of that kind of stuff get me going. Um, oh, I, I run, I, I can run without getting a horrible stitch in my side. I was running, I mean, I was doing Iron Man stuff. I, I wasn't doing the full Iron Man, but I was doing sprint, sprint triathlons and a couple of half half Iron Man things. I, I can run a long ways before my before my side hurts. So, I, but if you're not a runner, d do something else. It's just movement. It's movement. It's it's um, you know, running for me is like it's it's a mantra. My feet, bing 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 bing. It's like the beat of something. It's getting. That's what it is. My writing process is sit down and type out my idea a little bit, walk around, talk to myself. Um, if you watch me write, you just call the guys with the white coats. I mean, I'm talking to myself like there's really, or talking to a character, like she or he is in the room. And um, I talk with people about it. I'll go out. I mean, I, I worked as a therapist for all those years, and I know a whole lot of therapists, and I know a whole lot of clients. And clients that I knew when they were 16 are in their 40s now. And we sit around talking about how the system screwed them up. And how the, the what what a lot of things that looked like they were good weren't good at all, and they're just things we didn't know, and the times that we did damage when we thought we were doing good. I mean, it's not good enough to want to help. You got to learn to help. Um, all of those things work their way into my stories, and I don't want to. You know, I'm not going to run you through a therapy session when I write the story, but I'll tell you about about a kid's a, a kid who's in who's in a traumatic living situation or having traumatic events happening all the time, I will tell you, you know, I'll create a character who feels like that. And so my writing process when I'm writing, I get out there and talk to people as much as I can, talk to old therapists that I used to work with, um, um, watch TV, watch the news, watch these idiots, I mean, you know, sit around and watch a couple of two or three Republican debates give me all kinds of humor. Um, but, the, but those, the, the political stuff that goes on in the world speaks to people's attitudes. It speaks to people's, um, you know, wish to have control. It does, it does a whole lot of that. So I watch everything. I mean, I watch it on the political level. I watch it on personal level. Um, I have a million, you know, kids write me letters. Adults write me letters. Um, there's all kinds of stuff. And then I just try to pull it all together. And then I say, okay... I've got this character. His name's Paul Baum, and I—it's a kid. It's actually it's one of my fans. He told he said you got to use my name in a book sometimes, so I put his name in my book. Why not? I mean, it's a great name. Um, and and then I say, okay, I, you know, he's a senior in high school. He swims. He's an open water swimmer. You know, different kind of swim. Um, and then start throwing these characters in and saying, okay, who's in his life? And what is what's what's the plot? What's going on that needs to get solved? What's he going to know at the end that he didn't know in the beginning? How am I going to make that happen? How am I going to throw things in his way? And then we'll do that.
Yeah, the general advice for, for writers putting stories together is you have to find the thread. I mean, it's, 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 I'm going to learn a whole bunch of stuff. It's like, if I'm a sculptor, I put all the clay down, but I'm not going to use it all. I have to find the thread, the thing that takes me from, from the beginning of my story to the end of the story. It's like, it's like Deadline is, Deadline is um, a story about a kid who finds out in the very first chapter he has a terminal illness. So I know two things. In the beginning, of the, in the beginning chapter, he finds out he has a terminal illness. The last chapter, he dies. Now, the, everything that I write has to stay on that thread. We are headed toward his death. We are headed toward the end of his year. This is it. He's, he's, gonna make, he's, gonna, he's putting down his footprint. He doesn't get to put down his footprint the way the rest of us do. He doesn't get all these extra years. Everything is important. Now I'm going to ask myself, what do I throw in his way to make it harder for him to put down that footprint? And whatever I just, you know, what works, works. And so I say, okay, I got all kinds of information here, but it's not all good. There's a thread, and it runs from the beginning to the day he, the, from the day he finds out he's dying till the day he dies. And I want that line to be straight as a string. I want everything that I tell in that story to move him down that line. And you can do that with any plot. How do I feel about the, la the large anti-bullying movement in the schools and on the internet? Um, I like it. I think it's misguided. I don't think it understands. I don't think it quite understands what bullying is. I think it's a mistake to, to categorize what's going on as bullying. I think it needs to be bigger than that. It's meanness. And I think one of the things that we need to understand, if I were going to go looking, if I were going to go looking for the places to find the bullies, I'd, I'd go looking in the place where kids get bullied. Because when I work with little kids and I see them get bullied, boy, the first chance they get, the first chance they get to go be mean, they go be mean too. Because you know what? It feels good. It feels good to be in to be in control after somebody's been kicking you around. And so what I think is, I think two things. I think one, we have to expand what we call bullying to, to just mistreatment. We start we need to start talking about decency in its larger sense. The second thing I think we need to do, you know, we've got all these teachers doing and parents and stuff doing this anti-bullying stuff. We're gonna look at the bullies and we're gonna do zero tolerance and all that kind of stuff. Good luck. I'll tell you what, if I'm a bully, if I'm a good bully, and you do zero tolerance with me, you will never see me do my stuff. I will, I will take it outside your, your peripheral vision like that. And I will be better at doing it than you will be at finding me. If we want to take care of bullying, where we, what we have to do is stop it at the adult level. I worked, all, I worked years and years and years in child abuse and neglect. And a whole bunch of thing that a whole bunch of things that some people call good parenting is bullying. If I'm going to use my size to make you behave and I'm going to threaten you with pain, that's bullying. You can call it anything you want. But when I get big enough, woe be unto you. If you bully me enough so that I don't care anymore, woe be unto you. We have to stop a thing that we have in this culture where we always have to find somebody to blame. And we always have to make them pay. There is no act. There is no act that doesn't have its own natural consequence. And sometimes, yeah, we have to we have to exact some consequences. But they always need to be a consequence that a kid can get empowered. He can fix what he broke. If we would do that, we would start to see bullying go away. We have all kinds of teachers. We have all kinds of teachers who bully. All kinds of people who say, by God, you do it my way or the highway. My way or the highway is bullying. You can't do it. And we need to start, we need to stop that at an adult level because kids look to adults to imitate what they're going to do. They do it over and over and over again. Home, school are the biggest places. That's where we have to start. I love that we have an anti-bullying movement. And I, I talk a lot about it in, in this next book. But the other thing that we have to do is say, we have, to, we have to look at how we behave. We have to take responsibility for how we behave as adults. We have to. And this is a bullying culture. We're, we're, we've, been, we've been in power a long, long time.
how much of a, how much of myself do I write into the characters? Um, a lot, a lot. You know, every every character, almost all my narrators are smart asses. You know, I grew up being a smart ass, and and that's just the name of the game. It is a, it is a voice I know, and I can put it into a fabulous athlete, and I can put it into a dweeb. But you can't write a story. I don't care whether you're writing fantasy, science fiction, whatever you write. Your point of view is the last thing it goes through before it gets on the paper. And I think, actually, I, I, I put myself, actually the fictional Chris Crutcher, into a book called The Sledding Hill. I put the author, Chris Crutcher, as the band author in The Sledding Hill. I didn't give myself any good lines or anything, but I, you know, I was familiar and I was being a smart aleck when I did it. But um, I put myself, I put, the, I put, you know, when I create a villain, I put the nasty Chris Crutcher in there someplace. I know, I know what it's like to, to, to take somebody's legs out with, with my words. I know what it's like. I've done it. I've done it when I get mad. I've, got, I've bullied people that way. And I don't like myself when I do that. And I'm embarrassed when I look back and, to see that I did do it. But boy, I'll tell you what, it's a great bad guy. It's a great bad guy. And then all I have to do if I want to make him a really bad guy is amp him up. And I have to have some sense of the badness of that guy, the meanness of that guy. If I'm going to tell that, if I'm going to tell it true, we all have a good guy in us and we all have a bad guy in us. And I'm using the term guy, but because I'm a man, but you know, it, it, we're, it's 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 uh, it's multi or it's it's multi uh, gender, but. Um, you do. You just get into um, avoiding writing stereotypical, stereotypical or two-dimensional characters. Um, stereotypes always there, and stereotypes are usually there for a reason. There's a truth to, to a stereotype. Um, but what I always try to do is say, okay, I'll, I'll look at the stereotype, and then I say, okay, go go opposite it, because you can always find somebody. You know, whatever stereotype there is, you can find. All you, if you go, if you know very many human beings, you can go out and find somebody who does it the other way. And so I will sometimes look at the stereotype and flip it. And um, I, do, I don't think I can say that I've missed all the stereotypes. Um, I've got an editor that jumps on them when they see them. Sometimes I put them in there for a reason. I mean, sometimes I will go for the stereotype, but usually I try to I try to announce that. And um, um, like I say, stereotypes are there. They're they're there for a reason, but sometimes it's not a good reason. And um, so, if I write it, the minute I look at a stereotype, I look at its opposite, and then I think in my head, okay, who do I know that? What 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 human being do I know that goes against the stereotype? And I know a lot of them. I always do, and that's the character that I go grab. And I've made so many mistakes in my lifetime looking at stereotypes and believing they were true. I mean, I, I, I could sit here and tell you forever, but um, the, the trick is avoid them. And, and, when you, and when you do use them, identify them. And when somebody catches you using them, admit it, and then you can do it. Closing statements, um, a couple of things. If, 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 you're, if you're watching this and you want to be a writer, Never let anybody tell you you, could, you can't do it. The one voice in my head over and over again when I was starting to write was, who's going to read a book by Chris Crutcher? You, you know, you didn't even read books. And it was that, you know, that who do you think you are, you're being too big for your britches voice, that almost, that almost crippled me as a writer. Never let anybody tell you that. Yeah, it's innovative. Yes, it does help to have you know, a, a, a penchant for words and a penchant for putting them together. Mostly it's hard work. And if you're willing to do the work and you really want to, you can find your way in the writing community someplace. And the other is, don't be afraid to tell the tough stories. Um, th those are the ones that need to be told. And, and you can tell them in fantasy, you can tell them in any genre. You can tell them in any genre. You know, Harry Potter's an orphan. I mean, Harry Potter's a, he's a dweeb when he starts out. And Harry Potter's a, he's got a lot of people's ear and a lot of people's eye. So that's it for closing statements. Um, I truly appreciate the opportunity to be, um, be in Houston and be in Spokane, Washington at the same time. 
and uh, to be this, you know, this informal and just sit and tell stories. So thank you.